10 and learn to swim for neuroblastoma. Neuroblastomas are typically going to occur in kids under age 5. It's exceptionally rare to see them in teenagers. Most of these are going to occur in kids in, in the first five years of life. These patients can present as what's termed the blueberry muffin babies where their skin can be studded with tumors. But their primary tumors are almost always, like virtual all, virtually always, going to be in the adrenal or the parasympathetic, or sorry, the sympathetic ganglia that are paraspinal in location. So if you hear posterior mediastinal tumor in a young child, that's when you want to think about neuroblastoma because those sympathetic ganglia that line the spine go all the way up and down the spine. So if you see something that posterior mediastinum, that could be a neuroblastoma. One of the great clues to this diagnosis that you might get clinically is that the urine catecholamines are elevated. So if you have access to this clinical testing and you get it up front, you can be really confident that you're looking at a neuroblastoma even before the biopsy if the catecholamines are elevated. And these tumors are characterized by nodules of cells embedded in neuropil. So the differential is going to be things like Wilms tumor. Because these are sitting on the adrenal gland, uh, sometimes they can creep around and invade into the kidney and look like renal tumors. Uh, it's important to know how to distinguish this from Wilms. And it's very important to be able to distinguish the specific subtypes of neuroblastoma that we're going to talk about at some length here. And the, probably the most important prognostic features to know about are MCN status and the MKI, the mitotic karyorectic index. So those are important prognostic markers that we'll talk about. So I think you probably caught on by now. I really like touch preps. The neuroblastoma is another one where I really like touch preps because here you're getting not only just the cohesive cells, but you're getting all this stuff that comes along with it. And you can see when you, when you get this in thinner areas, you can see this stuff is this kind of feathery stroma. This is neuropil. So you've got the diagnosis right here. You've got a mix of cells and kind of different sizes and shapes and degrees of differentiation and this neuropil stroma that's going to be a neuroblastoma here's a really good look and you can see you got these immature cells you got some slightly larger cells this one's binucleated it's got some cytoplasm some evidence of kind of ganglionic differentiation and this wispy neuropil that came with it so low power of a typical neuroblastic tumor you're going to have this really nodular architecture this tumor is going to separate itself into these nodules and when you get to higher power you're going to see these nodules are composed of cells with variable density in this background stroma. And this background stroma is this feathery looking neuropil. And again, you can see that here's an, a cell starting to go with some evidence of differentiation. So when we talk about differentiation of the neuroblasts, these are immature neuroblasts. There's almost no cytoplasm with them. This one is multinucleated. That's one way to have evidence of differentiation. The other is to see it's elaborating a lot of cytoplasm. And one of the things you're going to want to do in, in neuroblastoma is be able to describe the proportion of the cells that are undergoing ganglionic differentiation. Interestingly, this is biopsies from three different, patient, three different points in the treatment course of one patient. So initially, this tumor was a very small proportion of cells that had this ganglionic differentiation, less than 5%. And then after some treatment, you still see neuropil in the background, but now you see many more of the cells have this ganglionic differentiation. And then eventually, at the end of uh, the most recent biopsy from this patient, you see only ganglionic cells exclusively embedded in Schwannian stroma, where you see this wispy uh, stroma that has nuclei in it. So that's Schwannian stroma, different from neuropil, it's acellular. So th that's important because this is useful in the schematic classification. So the schematic classification is how we determine whether or not these tumors have favorable or unfavorable histology. And this is an incredibly detailed scheme. The first thing you have to look at is how much of the stroma is Schwannian. And if it's less than 50%, you're looking at a neuroblastoma. And if it's more than 50%, then you're going to have to do some other things to figure out what type it is. So let's, let's go through this step by step. So the first decision point is that Schwannian stroma. If you have something that's at least 50% Schwannian stroma, then there's three answers it could be. The first is if you see a gross nodule, and that gross nodule is microscopically neuroblastic, it's microscopically a neuroblastoma, that's going to be ganglioneuroblastoma nodular. And the prognosis for that patient is going to be based on the histology that you see in that nodule. If you see no nodules, then you look at the neuroblasts that you see in the tumor. If the neuroblasts are all in Schwannian stroma, then you're looking at a ganglioneuroma. That's automatically a very favorable prognosis. 
And if you see any neuropil and cells in that neuropil, that's a ganglioneuroblastoma intermixed, also quite favorable. So let's go to the other half of the decision tree. If you have something that is less than 50% Schwannian stroma, you're looking at a neuroblastoma. And the choices here are if you see no neuropil. So essentially, if you need immunohistochemistry chemistry to even tell that this is a neuroblastoma, that is an undifferentiated neuroblastoma, and that is automatically unfavorable histology. But if you see some Schwannian, sorry, if you see some neuropil, then the degree of differentiation is, is what distinguishes the other two categories. If there's at least 5% of the neuroblast differentiating, you're going to call that differentiating neuroblastoma. But if it's less than that, you're going to call it poorly differentiated. And I'll say this classification only applies to the initial biopsy. If it's a subsequent biopsy, you just say neuroblastoma with status post-therapy, and you don't change the classification of the tumor. So the last piece on this slide, oops, the last piece on this slide is putting together that un undifferentiated poorly differentiated or differentiating subtype. I said undifferentiated, it's automatically unfavorable histology. Well, the mitotic karyorectic index, the proportion of the cells that are undergoing mitosis or karyorexis, put together with the patient's age is what's going to determine whether or not it's favorable or unfavorable histology. This is the current clinical classification for neuroblastoma. And it's pretty complex, but there's a couple things I want to point out because they're really important. First of all is if the MYCN amp gene is amplified, in any of these groups, that is automatically going to put the patient in the highest risk category. Now, these groups are L1 and L2. This is based on imaging criteria, whether or not the tumor is encasing vessels and things like that. M is a metastatic tumor, and MS is a special stage. It used to be called 4S when this was a numeric scoring system, or a numeric rating system. But MS is a special stage where metastasis is limited to the skin, the liver, and less than 10% of the marrow cellularity without a discrete lesion in the bone. And boy, that's a mouthful, but those kids are really important to identify because they are extremely favorable prognosis. And the other piece to know about is if you're dealing with a patient who's metastatic or thought to be metastatic, uh, DNA ploidy is, is something important to do. So again, this is why this is why doing that touch prep or triage is so important. If you can identify it's a neuroblastoma and you can set aside a specimen for the DNA ploidy, you've really helped yourself out. All right, so here's the highlights of neuroblastoma. These are going to happen in young kids. The tumors are going to rise in the adrenal gland or the sympathetic chain. These patients are going to have urine, urine cholecatamines generally that are elevated. And then you're going to have to put together the patient's age, the histologic type, the NKI, the MKI, the MECAN amplification status, and maybe even DNA ploidy to put that patient into an appropriate clinical stratification category. All right, that was a lot. So let's take another breath at Crested Butte here.